Good morning. Let me tell you, you don't have to be married to enjoy this sermon and this service, but it does help. What I'm especially hopeful for is that God's word today really helps you appreciate how deeply loved you are, what it means to be in that marriage kind of relationship with Jesus Christ. It's an amazing concept in God's Word, often neglected. So our opening hymn today, my wife painfully reminded me, because I forgot, was the opening hymn at our wedding, 43 and a half years ago. And we stood there and at, at the altar singing this song. I'm not sure if I sang or not. I was... Uh, rather emotional, <laughs> but looking, thinking back and uh, listening to Pastor, uh, Pastor Rosso's sermon, remembering how uh, when we started dating, all my friends complained. Uh, they, they accused me of being infatuated and that it was puppy love because, you know, if there was a five-minute break between classes... Professor Laughlin Adler is remembering, probably. <laughs> if there was a five-minute break between classes, I would find her coming out of her class to walk to the next class before being parted again. You know, and We'd sit together in chapel, and we would, uh, uh, I would pick her up at her dorm every morning and go to breakfast and go, go for prayer together, and we, we just spent all our time together. God's word says, Jesus wants this with you. That's an amazing thing. I pray that you are blessed. Let's sing our opening hymn. Number 694, stanzas 1, 2, and 5. <laughs> Would you stand? Hear, O oh daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your people in your father's house. The 
In the Song of Solomon, we're given an image of the bridegroom, Solomon and his bride. A love story of mutual devotion and delight. He says, The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains and bounding over the hills. This love story also demonstrates the relationship between Christ and his church, a relationship confident in pure desire, one for the other. How beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. wonderful and confident feeling to profess, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Yet there may be times when we do not always feel that way. Could Jesus truly love me in spite of what I have done? Have I really kept Jesus as the most precious thing in my life? Let us consider our thoughts as we come before our Heavenly Father. Gracious Heavenly Father. You shall no more be termed forsaken, but you shall be called, My delight is in her. This is at the heart of the gospel promise. Jesus wants you to have this kind of confidence and faith in his love and commitment and delight that you would boast in the spirit, Yes, I belong with Jesus. He loves me and delights in me as evidenced in his death and resurrection. His love for you is far greater than you can imagine, far deeper than you know. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you for all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
pray together. I'd like to, like to ask you to take out the insert that's in your worship folder. Pray the prayer that is printed here. We're doing this, of course, because if we printed it in the worship folder itself, you would take it home and forget about it. We're hoping that you take this home and that this prayer repeats the thoughts of today as you go through the week and then that you follow along as well in reading and in meditating on God's word. This is a somewhat unusual prayer. That is, it uses language for our relationship with Jesus that we don't always use. And yet this is the thought in God's word today. Lord Jesus, thank you that I am yours. Thank you for delighting in me, for desiring me, for falling head over heels in love with me. Your tender words of promise have changed my life. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are mine. Pour out your spirit on me so I can delight in you, desire you, and fall head over heels in love with you. Let my words of promise, though often broken, lead me back into a deeper and more intentional relationship with you. Lord Jesus, put people in my life who regularly help me seek you. Strengthen and increase my relationships of faith. Give me opportunity to help others seek after you, Lord, trusting that you delight to be found. Give me the faith to rest in these words. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Amen. Please be seated as we hear from God's word. The Old Testament lesson from the 62nd chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you, will, you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so, sh so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord.
Thank you. Would you stand as we hear the good news, the words of our Savior? The Holy Gospel is recorded for us by St. John in his third chapter. And here we learn that the joy is not only for the bride and the groom, but also for the best man. Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Ionine near Salim, because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone's going to him. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. We confess our faith and our joy in Christ in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll sing our sermon hymn, the first three verses of Jesus, Thy Boundless Love to Me, number 683. Much grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ. Amen. Uh, you'll 
find it in our Old Testament lesson today, but not just there in Isaiah. It goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 20, the covenant at Mount Sinai. And you'll find it in our gospel lesson for today, John 3, but it's found throughout the epistles. It reaches all the way to the very last book of the Bible, Revelation in chapter 19, with the beginning of a party we know as the marriage feast of the Lamb. That image runs throughout Scripture, this image of Christ and the church, of God's chosen people and the God who chose them as a bridegroom and a bride, a husband and a wife, of being loved and loving right back. That biblical image is all about an intimate, mutual, joyful, exclusive relationship of longing and delight. You'll find the text for our sermon this morning in the fine print under the message there at the top of page 7 in the worship folder. There's just a few select verses from the Song of Solomon. We could have read more, but uh, the Song of Solomon gets a little bit racy, so we decided to kind of narrow the readings. It's PG-13. Actually, it's PG-30. Did you know that? There's a long-standing Jewish tradition that you're not supposed to read the Song of Songs until you're at least 30 years old. So we, we kept it to select verses today. And we'll pick them out kind of one at a time. We're going to begin with the bride's perspective. There's three different perspectives in these short verses that help us understand our relationship with Jesus better, what Jesus thinks about us, but also our relationship with other people in the church. So the first verse we want to look at is the last verse selected there. Song of Solomon 6, verse 3, where the bride says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Or as we said in the response of reading, I am my beloved and his desire is for me. In the original Hebrew, I believe there's a hubba hubba there in the text. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. That's a word of confidence. That's a a word of of surety, a word of joy and delight. That's a, a word spoken at the altar. Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband. I will, I do, I am my beloved's. Oh yes, and my beloved, he is mine. That's the kind of confidence that I think Jesus is inviting us into again today. A confidence that no matter what else is going on in your life, you might be able to say with surety and certainty, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. You belong to Jesus, and you can have confidence in that. And, although we don't often say it that way, the hymn said it, I, as the branches to the vine, I am his, and he is mine. You belong to Jesus, and there's a sense in which you can say faithfully, Jesus belongs to you. Jesus wants you to have the confidence in his love and commitment and compassion and delight that you'd be able to boast in the Spirit, oh yes, I am my beloved's. I belong with Jesus and Jesus, uh, he belongs with me. That confidence in the tender love of Jesus belongs to that image of the bridegroom and the bride. It's a confidence that includes your mind and your body, but also your heart. You've heard it said before, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. I think sometimes we're better at loving the Lord our God with all of our mind or maybe with all of our strength. Uh, Shoot, I'd rather love my neighbor as myself than love the Lord my God with all my heart. The Emotions are something we kind of get scared of sometimes when we talk about religion, right? I mean, we're a pretty straight-laced crowd. We smile loudly in church. Don't give too many amens or raise our hands too high. Someone might look a little funny at us from the next pew. We know that emotions can be a part of your faith, but we don't trust them. And for good reason. Your emotions can lead you astray. Your emotions can lie to you. And yet, at the heart of our relationship with God is this emotional response, an emotion that God says God has for you, that Jesus says you are on his heart. He knows you by name. He knows every hair on your head, and he loves you. He delights in you. You make Jesus smile. You make Jesus laugh. You make Jesus sing for joy and do his happy dance. Jesus absolutely loves being in a relationship with you. 
Jesus thinks you're awesome. And that kind of an emotional feeling on the part of Jesus calls forth an emotional response for us as well. Yeah, of course, you don't want to take that too far. You don't want to make religion all about your emotions. And there are times in our faith life when it even feels a little hollow or empty, and, and, and that's okay. You don't ground your relationship on those emotions, just like in a marriage. You don't ground your relationship with that. That giddy day of getting married, of being head over heels in love, like Pastor Neuendorf said, he used to be caring up between classes if they had a five-minute break. He couldn't stand to be separated from, from her that long. And yet they still get up every morning and go to devotions. I've seen them do it online. They still spend time praying together. I was speaking with a, a couple that's been married 49 years last night after worship. And they said, I, I asked them, I said, so are you still head over heels in love? And they said, yes. Well, sometimes. Uh, most of the time. Uh, maybe. They said, our love has grown deeper over the years. It's changed. It's shifted. It's, it's matured. She's had some health problems, and so he's had to kind of take care of her some at home. And she said even that difficulty has brought them closer together and made their love deeper one for another. So this relationship we're talking about isn't just about your emotions. I mean, what happens if you wake up after the wedding ceremony, a couple of days later or a couple of weeks later or a couple of years later, if you're like, me and my wife Miriam, it's been 26 years and four kids. What if you wake up 26 years and four kids later and you're just not quite as giddy? You don't feel it quite the same way. You're not sure you would say you're madly head over heels in love. You don't base your relationship only on that emotional experience. There's a confidence in the relationship that gets you through even when you don't feel head over heels in love. I have confidence that my wife loves me even when I don't feel like it. In fact, I have confidence that Miriam loves me even when she doesn't feel like it. <laughs> you see, there's a commitment, there's a relationship there, there's a confidence in the relationship that goes beyond our emotions but it also is supposed to include our emotions. It goes beyond our emotions, but it doesn't omit our emotions. Our emotions aren't a true litmus test for our relationship, but if I never feel like I'm a little bit head over heels in my lo of love, if Miriam never gets just a little bit giddy, if her heart never races a little bit for me like it used to, wouldn't I want to work on that? And I don't mean work on the emotions as if somehow trying harder to feel something would get some kind of authentic response. No, I mean work on the relationship. You see, if you chase the emotions, you'll bounce around from relationship to relationship. But if you, if you chase the relationship, the emotions come along with it. I think following Jesus is like that. It is good, meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places have the kind of faith that says, I know God loves me in Jesus Christ even if I don't feel like it. And if you never feel like God loves you in Jesus Christ, if your heart never races just a little bit, if you have never known the delight of Jesus' love or a response of love shaped in you, if your emotions are not a part of that relationship, I think Jesus wants you to long for something more, but not to work on your relationship, not all of a sudden try shouting amen or raising your hand in worship. I mean, you can do that if you want to, but, you know, you'll still get some strange looks around here. That's not the way we roll, and that's okay. You're emotional people. You're just emotional in a quieter way. I love that about you. You don't chase the emotions, you chase the relationship. So that as you spend time with God and God's word, as you hear what Jesus says about you, as you see that love in real tangible ways in your life that awakes and evokes and calls forth in you a response as well. You don't bear the burden of doing the right things or saying the right things or even feeling the right things at the right time. If you come to Thanksgiving worship and you're feeling kind of depressed, that's okay. Be depressed. Jesus is still there with you. If we get to Christmas and you're kind of sad while everybody's singing the most wonderful time of the year, that's okay. Be sad. You don't have to be happy at Christmas. Jesus is still with you. 
If you didn't say to your mom or dad or your spouse this morning, oh boy, we get to go to worship, I can't wait. It's okay. Jesus was still saying to the Father in heaven, did you see who's coming to our house today? I can't wait. Your emotional response is covered and wrapped in a relationship of confidence. You don't have to feel any certain thing at any certain time. Jesus loves you. Just you the way you are, the way you are with your feelings, whatever you happen to be feeling or not feeling today. Jesus loves you, the, the real you, the you that can be all over the place when it comes to feeling, the you that doesn't always live up to even what you imagine faith and following Jesus is supposed to be like. So your faith doesn't depend on your emotions, and your emotions are a part of your faith. Jesus loves you intimately and personally and playfully, and you, you don't have to manufacture some kind of response, but you do get to know more closely and more intimately this Jesus who knows and loves you closely and intimately. That's the bride's perspective. She gives us a confidence that goes beyond our emotions and yet includes our emotional response. She teaches us to say, I am my beloved's. Oh, yes, I am. And my beloved, he is mine. That's an amazing, confident statement. And you can see in the text where the bride's confidence comes from. It's in that first verse in the fine print under the message in your worship folder. It comes from so Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 7. After a wonderfully exhaustive and PG-30 inspection of the bride, the groom gives this verdict of delight. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Because of your relationship with God in Jesus Christ, Jesus says of you, you are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. And I don't know about you, but what I imagine Jesus saying to me something like that, something like you are altogether beautiful, Justin. There is no flaw in you. When I hear Jesus say something like that, my first immediate and knee-jerk reaction is, yeah, right. You know, like, come on, Jesus, come on. I know my weak, I know my weaknesses. I, I know my sins of thought and word and deed. I, I know my own failures and shame. I know what I said to my kids. I know what I didn't say to my wife. I know how frail and weak I am, how doubt can still cling to me. I know things about my weak that I'd be ashamed to admit from the pulpit. And Jesus says about me, you're all together beautiful as david says i know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me or as isaiah points out the same isaiah who said your land will be called my delight is in her that same isaiah says all our righteous acts even the best ones are like filthy rags so when jesus says to you you are altogether beautiful my darling there is no flaw in you. I, I understand if your immediate reaction is, yeah, right. I mean, there's a big asterisk behind that, right, Jesus? But here's one of the things that I've come to learn. In fact, I think I heard it first from my dad, maybe from my dad in the pulpit. One of the things I've learned over time is that when Jesus says something, he intends you to believe it. When the scriptures give you a word from God, it's a word God intends for you to hold on to and believe. If Jesus says it, he actually means it. So when Jesus says to you, you are altogether beautiful, my darling, there is no flaw in you. I know your reaction could be, yeah, right. But I invite you to set that reaction aside for a moment because when Jesus says you are altogether beautiful, he actually means it. He actually believes it, and he wants you to believe it. Jesus loves spending time with you. Jesus enjoys your company. You make Jesus smile. You make Jesus laugh. Jesus is so proud of you. Jesus loves hanging out with you. Jesus thinks you are awesome. Jesus absolutely loves being in a love relationship with you. You give Jesus joy. 
So when Jesus says to you, you are altogether beautiful, my darling, there is no flaw in you. Jesus wants you to trust that word of promise as if maybe he meant it, as if maybe he actually thought you were altogether beautiful. Now, of course, you're not perfect, not yet. You're not perfect the way you're going to be in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Of course, there's not that status of no flaw in you the way it will perfectly be when Jesus comes again and there's a new heaven and a new earth. Of course, real contrition and real sorrow and real repentance over your sins belongs to your life of faith. But in spite of that, more than that, you need to know not just that you're a sinner, but that you are altogether beautiful. Hey, it's like Pastor Nundorf said a couple weeks ago. Do you remember when he was juggling that, that sledgehammer, that hand sledgehammer and, and a Kleenex? Do you remember that? And he said we need to know the word of the law, that heavy word of law that crushes us and destroys us, that drives us to our knees. But he also says I don't carry that sledgehammer around in my pocket. It would weigh me down. It would keep me from doing my job. In fact, he doesn't even keep it in his toolbox. I think you said you keep it in your, your tool shed, right? I mean, you know where it is. You need to know that you're a stinking sinner, that there's nothing you can do that could earn God's grace or favor. But the thing that defines your identity is something much more light, something, something lighter, something more beautiful, something more joyful. We, we laughed afterwards. It's too bad that the Kleenex couldn't have been more precious or beautiful. It's kind of a crumple and throwaway kind of thing. And yet, what a beautiful image. It's light, it's airy. You can carry it with you. You can share it with someone else when they're in need, that beautiful identity in Jesus, that Jesus delights in you, that he actually believes you are altogether beautiful. That's the thing you keep with you. That's the verdict of delight, and your sinfulness cannot overturn that verdict. You need to know you're a sinner, uh, but we're kind of not talking about that right now. You need to know down to your bones, in your guts, in your heart, down to the tips of your shoes, that you are loved. That Jesus thinks you are just amazing. That he cannot wait to spend some more time from you, with you. That he loves hearing your prayers and sharing your grief and knowing your struggles. And being with you not just in worship, but on Tuesday afternoon or Thursday night. The bride's confidence when she says, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. He belongs with me. That bride's confidence to say something as audacious as I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. That audacity of grace does not come from her own self-evaluation. She's not looking at her dress and saying, wow, aren't I pretty today? She's not proud of her makeup and her hair. I mean, she looks great, but her focus isn't on her own evaluation. Her focus is on her groom. Have you been there? Have you seen it happen? Have you been in this sanctuary and seen the bride come around the corner, maybe on her dad's arm and as she walks down the aisle? Have you looked and seen the groom up here with his best man and he turns and looks and his face lights up and that's where the bride finds her confidence, not in her own self-evaluation, not in what her friends say about her hair or her dress, but in the words that are on the lips of her groom, you're altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. The bride's confidence is in the promise of the groom. Uh, but there's some more people in the scene of Song of Solomon. I forget about them sometimes. I always remember the bride and the groom. But there's also these characters in the Song of Solomon, the friends, the best man, the, the maid of honor, the whole wedding party is there. And if you look kind of in the middle of those verses in the fine print under the sermon, you'll see Song of Solomon chapter 6, verse 1. These friends say to the bride, where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? They're clinking the glasses. They're expecting a kiss. The groom has stepped outside for some fresh air, and the brood is like the, groom, the, bride, the bride and groom. I called her the broom. <laughs> the bride is like, where is he? They're clinking the glasses, and the best man walks up and says, oh, no, I know where he is. Come on, I'll take you to him. You don't want to miss this. That's the situation when the friends say, where is your beloved gone? We will seek him with you. 
the, the best man, the maid of honor, the wedding party, they belong to that relationship too. They're committed to these two people that are getting married. They want to see their marriage be a success. They're a part of the love relationship that's intimate between the bride and the groom. They're there to say, come on, let's go find the groom. A groom who's not hiding because he doesn't want to be found, but a groom who loves to be found by the bride. That's the image in the Song of Solomon, the groom who loves to be found by the bride. So we see there is this individual and personal aspect of our relationship with God and Jesus, and there's also this, we're all in it together. You are the bride of Christ, and yet, yet all of you together are also the bride of Christ, the church. It's individual and personal, and yet it's also I mean, if I were still in Texas, I, I, I'd say there, there's, an all, there, there's a you and an all y'all. You, you see, in Texas, y'all could actually be singular. Did you know this? I learned this. It took me a couple of years. Y'all could be singular. All y'all is plural. You and all y'all, both of those things are true of you. You as an individual delight Jesus and all y'all together are the church, the bride of Christ. So you have been given the gift and the blessing of a wedding party designed by God to help you find the one who delights in being found by you. And you have been given the gift and blessing of being in the wedding party, of being the best man, of, of being the, the maid of honor, of being able to say to your friends, your family members, the people in your neighborhood, the people at your workplace, hey, the glasses are tinking. I, I know you're looking for Jesus. I know it can be hard to find him sometimes, but I'm here. I'm committed to your relationship with Jesus. Let me seek him with you. Let's go find him together. He loves being found by you, and I love being your friend to help you find him. And, and again, the, the focus isn't on how perfectly you do it. Just like I know I'm a stinking sinner, and yet Jesus says he delights in me, I know the church is full of stinking sinners. And yet Jesus delights in us as the bride of Christ. If you've been here more than about three months, somebody's probably stepped on your toes here at church because we're a fallen people and we bring our own brokenness and fallenness with us even when we come to worship. I've been here about three months now, so I've probably stepped on your toes. I'm sorry, whoever you are, I didn't do it on purpose. Or you know what, maybe I did. That's how rotten I am. Sometimes I step on your toes on purpose and then later regret it. In relationship in the church, you know you've experienced that we're not perfect. In case there is any doubt, let me tell you up front in front of God and everybody that your pastors aren't perfect. Let me tell you up front in front of God and everybody that the person sitting in the pew next to you isn't perfect. And I want to tell you, so what? That's okay. That's not what we're talking about right now. If you waited for the person next to you to be the perfect person to help you follow Jesus, well, you never ask for someone else to help you follow Jesus. If I waited until I knew enough or, or, or could pray well enough or knew enough Bible verses, if I waited until I was perfect before I helped somebody else look and find Jesus, I'd never help anybody find Jesus. You do not carry the burden of getting it right. Here at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School, we are going to mess up as we try to follow Jesus together. We are going to sin against one another and make bad decisions as well as good. And that's covered in the blood of the Lamb. You get to be on an adventure of following Jesus together that doesn't depend on how well you do it or how perfect you are at helping other people find Jesus. You get to say, like John the Baptist, the joy of the friend of the groom is mine. I don't have to get it right. I just get to point to Jesus. There's so much in the Song of Songs, in the Song of Solomon. There's so much we're not going to talk about here, but here let's just look at these three things. The perspective of the friend that says, I don't have to get it right. I just get to enjoy pointing someone to Jesus. The perspective of the bride that says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And both of those grounded on this promise of Jesus, who says to you and all y'all, you are altogether beautiful, my darling. There's no flaw in you. <laughs> what a delight. Amen.
Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. We have a sung response that's printed for you in your worship folder on page 7. Before we gather our offerings, let's rise to sing. gather our offerings, our gifts of love to our Savior. While we're doing that, we ask a special favor. There's a black folder at the end of each pew at the center aisle. Would you grab that, sign it, pass it along for other people to sign? It's a part of our bridegroom responsibilities. So we're taking care of each other, wanting to know one another. We want to know that you were here uh, in case we don't get a chance to, to talk and, and for you also to have a chance to say, hey, I need somebody to talk to me. Thanks. That was one of those moments where I didn't want to get up and get the offering plates, because I know there's a lot more of that. <laughs> and yet, yeah, that was Rachmaninoff Symphony in E-flat, yeah, which has been made a pop song, I'll Never Love Again. <laughs> I want you to think about that. It's the... It's the I, I, It'd be great to listen to that song, actually. It's very fitting. Uh, there, there would be no love like this one. Let's stand and sing together as we pray.
Lord Jesus, how is this possible? That we could be, not just we, that I could be your bride. That you could love me, each one of us, all so different, all so wounded, broken, confused. Your Father promised you to us like, a, like an engagement, like a betrothal. He promised that you would come, and we waited long. And you came. You came, and you gave yourself to us. We have, we have come to this altar how many times and you have offered yourself to us to be one with you, to be united to you. Lord Jesus, how could this be? For we know our sin. It's always before us. All those things that others don't see, we are painfully aware of. And you know them all even more. And yet knowing this, you died for us. Knowing this, you rose for us. Knowing this, you drew us to yourself by your Holy Spirit. Knowing this, you have planned for us a wedding feast. The joy is so great that it hurts. Thank you, dear Jesus for loving me. Lord, in your mercy. Yes, dearest Savior, dearest, <clears throat> beloved Savior, we pray for those who, those who in their earthly relationships find brokenness and pain. We pray, Lord, for those who have not found a partner in life, who, who wait yet for that special gift. We pray, Lord, for those who have had such a gift, but, but sin has broken it. And sin breaks all things. Oh, Lord, we pray for those who had this wonderful gift and then time, and illness, and at last death, separated us. We pray, dear Lord, for those who are, who are in a very special relationship, and yet there's confusion, there's anger, there's misunderstanding, there's pain. Lord, all our earthly relationships, our friendships, our romantic love, all these things are but seeing through a glass darkly. They are only a glimpse, a hint of the true gift, the real marriage, the ultimate oneness. And this is the gift you have given to us, to each of us, whatever our status or condition in life may be, whether we have many friends or few or none, whether we are celebrating today with family or whether we are alone, you are always with us. The glasses clink. We turn to find you and you will always be there to embrace us, to draw us home. Lord, in your mercy, Dearest Jesus, we pray that you would bless those who are in difficulty today, those who are alone, those who are unemployed, those who are afraid for the future, those, Lord, who are grieving because of the past. We ask you, dear Savior, to bless those who are sick, to carry those who are weak, 
to heal those who are in need of your special power. We pray for Judy and Don and Rich, Nola and Jerry, and Greg and Jeremiah, all of them in treatment for cancer and for many others that we know. Lord, we ask for your continued blessing for Isaiah as he's recovering from, from uh, pneumonia. We continue to pray for Carl, for Karen and Susan, Muriel and Steve and Branson and Kay as they are recovering from surgery or illness. Strengthen and uplift them. Lord, be with Michael, your beloved. As he is in hospice care, waiting and waiting, knowing that the day will come, that, that the bridegroom will come and call him and take him home. Comfort Luella and Bill, Alexandra and Sally, Jim and Mike, Ann and Charlene. They have illnesses that, that go on, perhaps, Lord, for all their life, and yet you are their strength and their beloved. Lord, in your mercy. Dearest Jesus, we pray for your guidance for our church. The bride of Christ in this place. You know that we are often weak and foolish. We struggle to serve you well, to show our love for you, and, and to lead others to know you. Lord, bless our plans. Bless our dreams together. As we seek to find new ways to, to reach the people in the homes and the apartment buildings and condominiums around us, there are so many new names and faces. We desire them to know you and to be loved by you. Lord, we seek a youth director for our congregation to bless our, the young people of our church. Guide us in the way that you would have us go. And all these things, and all others that we, Lord, long, your, long for your leadership and blessing, we bring to them to you. In the words that you taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Just a few announcements. We're still, still collecting for Operation Christmas Child. We want to bless little children wherever around the world. So there's boxes at the back. There's especially a whole lot of boxes up at the front. Um, other years we've run out. But uh, we don't have as many people in the church for worship as we used to have. Uh, temporarily, I pray. So maybe you want to pick up a second one. Uh, whatever. Anyway, up to you. We have to have them back by the middle of November. So that's coming up. Um, Pastor Chet, that was last night. The fall unity is out, and I didn't grab one to have it up here. Uh, it's our quarterly newsletter as a congregation, and a lot of excellent stuff in there. I hope that you will read it. It's a beautiful fall uh, cover, and um, I think you'll enjoy it. And then finally, our elder Myron. Myron, where, where's you at? There you are. With the orange shirt so you can find him. He'll be up front after church. If you just want somebody to, to pray with you about something, he's the best man, and he will lead you to Jesus today. Let's sing our last hymn. The King of Love, My Shepherd Is. Thank you. 